and sisters. We come now at this time and in this way to think about the bare people. And so, for our reading today, this nice warm August day here that just started. Uh, oh, and we want to, did a little while ago, but we also want to stop and, and uh, remember at this time that, you know, there was a lot of speculation about when Jesus was actually born. And I guess some think it was around this time, in the summertime. And so, uh, you know, you might think about saying happy birthday. And, uh, and also, too, we want to think about those who are in harm's way and those who are in need. And uh, remember them in your prayers. So, so uh, our Hebrew Bible reading for today is from 1 Kings 3, 3 through 14. And uh, this is a this is a story here of, of Solomon. So if you want to get your uh, Hebrew Bible open or your your uh, Old Testament, whatever you want to call it, get it opened up to First Kings three uh, three three through fourteen. Solomon loved God, walking in the statutes of his father David. Only. He sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice to him, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, God appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O oh God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, although I am only a little child. I do not know how to go or come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this great people? It pleased God that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Now also, too, we want to look at our reading from the New Testament, which is Matthew 3, 1 through 12. Matthew 3... 1 through 12. Now this, this is a story of John the Baptist. And so we want to look at that now. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. 
This is the one whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of God. Make God's paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him and all the region along the Jordan. And they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their wrongdoings. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to ba for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestors. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of it to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit, good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water. For repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the grain. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Hear the word of the Gospel of Matthew. All right. What exactly is a bear person? Well, to totally understand that, we've got to got to look at our Indian religious tradition and and gain a better understanding of what bear medicine is all about. And uh, now, when I speak about these things, I can only speak about my experience, my training, my teaching, where I come from. So I only speak with my voice. There are many different cultures, Indian religious cultures across North America, many similarities and some differences. And so you might want to do some research into that. But uh, in the way that I have walked these many decades and uh, shared the wisdom, the teaching, and the, and the power, I have been uh, come to an understanding that Bear medicine lies in the West. That is the direction of the West. A place known as the Wisdom Way. And it's uh, in that place we think about the heart and the mind of our Creator. You know, our Creator is unseen. And in the West we think about the great space where, you know, it is unseen. And uh, now the medicine also of the bear it's not just wisdom. Wisdom by itself is good, but it's even better if it comes with others. And so, bear medicine also is about strength. What good does it do to be wise and yet not have the strength to be courageous, to speak that wisdom even against opposition? And also, too, what good is strength and wisdom without gentleness? Because in order to truly understand wisdom, in order to use your courage or strength in a good way, you also have to be able to walk in another person's moccasins for a while to understand where they're coming from. So wisdom has to, must have balance. Strength must have balance. And gentleness brings that balance. We think about the great bear, we think about out in the wilderness, how massive it is, especially like the grizzly, the brown bear, even the black bear, when it's full, full grown, can be up to 400 pounds, I believe. The ones I've seen out there in northern New Mexico are pretty good size, especially when you're riding on a motorcycle and you pass one by. <laughs> 
So anyway, uh, the uh, air is so strong and so powerful that they don't need to be addressed. They have confidence in their strength and in their power. And as such, they can afford to be gentle. Because they know that they can stand up whatever comes their way. So they don't need the bully. They don't need to push it around. Force people to bend to their will. There is no wisdom in that. And what we look at here in the story of Solomon, what we see here is that Solomon had the opportunity as a king, you know. He, his, his mom was a part of that. But if you go back and look at the story of how Solomon ascended to the throne, you, you'll find out that uh, uh, Solomon was not David's firstborn son. So, you know, by, by tradition, which really hadn't existed, but by the tradition of other kings in the, in the, in the region, you know, the firstborn son was supposed to inherit the kingdom. And Solomon was not the firstborn son. And so there was a little power play that took place there. <clears throat> a little guilt trip in. And, but and Solomon, as a young man, he was, he was very young when he took the throne, was installed. And uh, he had the courage to be kind and gentle to those who sought to usurp him and give him a second chance. And unfortunately, it didn't work out. And he had to uh, he had to round them up and, and you know uh, hold them accountable for their actions. So, but he did give them a second chance, and that's important. So, when we look at Solomon, we look at a young man who was put into a position where he could have gone off on an ego trip to the max. Could have been all about him. Could have gone for, for money, power, whatever. But that wasn't his priority. Solomon was concerned about the welfare and the well being of the people. Solomon was devoted to service and helping to improve the quality of life for all the people. And so, in that sense, he went and he made this offering to God. God came to Solomon after being made king and said, all right, what do you want? And, uh, you know, like so many other kings or egocentric people, they spat off a list of, you know, me first, let me. But Solomon wasn't like that. Solomon's priority, as we read here, help me figure out how to rule these people in a good way. So when we think about Solomon, we think about how fair people leave great footprints for us to follow. Now, when we go to John the Baptist, we've got a big story here. When we think about where John the Baptist was coming from, what was going on, you know, uh, the Messiah theology would belong to a specific sect within the Jewish culture and, and they they were you know looking for a savior, a redeemer, somebody to free him. And so the people had an expectation. But uh, John the Baptist, you know, uh, uh, was uh, it was Elisha or reincarnated one of them, you don't remember? Uh, ah. Boy, now, now you know you're getting older when you can't remember the prophets who were supposed to be reincarnated. Well, I'll look it up later, but he was supposed to be, or he believed to be, I'm pretty sure it was Elisha, the reincarnation of Elisha, and if it's the wrong name of the prophet, you can correct me. But, uh, uh, you know, he is definitely, John the Baptist, when he's born and he's doing his thing, he is definitely the embodiment of a bear person. Living off by himself. Now, bears are known to wander individually, 
by themselves until wintertime, then they come together. Uh, then also you think about what he dressed in. It says that he wore clothing. You look at verse 4, it says he wore clothing made out of camel's hair. And I don't know how many, probably not many of you, have ever had a one-on-one -on -one with a camel. If you haven't, find one and go have a one-on-one -on -one with a camel. Because uh, I've had plenty of opportunities to have one-on-ones with camels. And camel hair is not fun. <laughs> camel hair is abrasive, it's stiff, and it is not something you want rubbing against your skin every day, all day long. The dude must have had a rash that would never end. But the fact is, that's what he wore. He wore clothing made out of camel hair, leather belt. I mean, you're talking the basics here. And he lived, you know, of course they say locusts and honey. Well, we don't know the full repertoire of his uh, diet, but the point is, is that, you know, he's living off locusts, which is a bug, great big insect, and, and wild honey. Now, how many of you would like to spend your days eating giant grasshoppers? Uh, you know, uh, not really eating grasshoppers, but anyway. And, and eating honey. I'm not, that probably made some of you queasy just thinking about it. But uh, that shows you, you know, here's a guy who's got that power of spirit coming through him, and he's living in the wilderness like a bear would. So he is the epitome in the New Testament of what a bear person is. And he's coming with, with courage, coming with power. And he is calling on the people to do right by God and by each other. You know, John's priority was to be of service and for the people to be of service. When he, uh, when he encountered the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he got in their face. He didn't pull any punches. When he was coming against social injustice, he was right down there on top of it. He was the bear landing on them with both feet. And he was challenging them, you know. He called them a, a brood of vipers. Of course, in Matthew, we know they had a political agenda when they were writing this, this gospel. But calling them a brood of vipers, I mean, that's as bad as low as an insult as you can get in first century Palestine. And so, he's telling them, uh, you know, you can't be saved unless you're sincere. You can't be redeemed unless you're sincere about this. And uh, so if you want to prove that you're sincere about your desire for repentance, to be forgiven for your wrongdoings, then you've got to do, do right by the people. Do good works, do good deeds. Well, you know, there's a lot of people who say, because in the Gospel of... Uh, Saul, Paul, he talks about, you know, works, works aren't going to get it done. But in fact, in truth, in this world, in this life, you can tell more about a person's motives from their actions than you can from their words. Uh, you know, deeds talk. And so uh, that's what he's talking about. That's what John the Baptist is saying to these Pharisees and Sadducees. You guys are the cream of the crop, the elite, the educated religious leaders, and you're you're thinking only of yourselves. You're not thinking of the people. You're exploiting others for your own personal gain, using God and religion to get your way. And John the Baptist gets in their face and says, that ain't right. What's right is for you to be of service. God to the people, to honor the sacredness of God and the sacredness of all life, doing good deeds. So John, he's got that strength and that power that the bearer presents. He's got that wisdom to understand the difference between those who aren't walking their talk. And he's got the, the strength and the courage to speak out. But where's the gentleness? 
Well, the gentleness was there. You know? But John, he could have run those Pharisees and Sadducees off. He could have said, hey, you don't belong with us. Get out of here. You're the bad guys. Hit the road. Go find somebody else. But he didn't. He called them on their stuff. He set a boundary with them, a healthy boundary. And then he gave them the chance, gave them the opportunity to be baptized. And they were baptized right along with everybody else. So he allowed the gentleness of his spirit to take over his anger and his, uh, well, resentment for what they had done, the way they had lived their lives. He gave an opportunity to join with all the other people to be redeemed, to gain that forgiveness for the wrongdoing. And that's where the gentleness comes in. And so when we think about that, we think about how through this, through these actions, through the way that he did his thing, the way John presented himself, the message that he carried, how he inspired the people to do right by God and each other and, and all the people for that. So, like Solomon, John wasn't focused on himself. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't trying to be the center of attention. He wasn't trying to make it all about him. He was trying to get the people to put their trust in God and our Creator and through that trust in God to let go of the need to control and dominate others and to be of good service. To trust that there's more to life than just being rich or powerful or in charge. And so that's what uh, John and Solomon were both into. And that's what qualifies them to be bare people, to be known as bare people. And so when we think about bare people, we remember the motives of Solomon and the motives of John the Baptist were to gain wisdom for the purpose of helping the people to trust in a power greater than themselves, trust in our Creator, and to do service, first and foremost, in their walk. So, have you prayed for wisdom? Have you asked God to help you to be of good service? To the people, to have a discerning spirit, to know when you are doing right by God and the people, when you are doing only for yourself. If you think about these things, and you decide what's next for you. Fucking beauty. Whatever.